You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 304, Exodus 26, 27, part 2. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you? Pretty good. You know, busy. We're just about, I'd say, 75, 80% packed and kind of sitting around looking at boxes, wondering why we're still here. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much worst. where we're at. <laughs> that's the worst. Yeah. Mm, but uh, the trip yeah, will but, be fun. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Mike. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping up Exodus 26 and 27 this week. Yeah, we are. Uh, you know, la- last time we, you know, we talked about these two chapters. Here it was really about the theological messaging uh, of the instructions and the construction uh, of the tabernacle. So this time, though, I want to sort of dip into something that you know is is historical in orientation but also a controversy uh, i alluded to this a bit in unseen realm uh, in the chapter about the tabernacle and the temple and sacred space and whatnot um today to refresh people's uh, memories of that we're going to get into the whole question of was the tabernacle again the tent structure moved inside the temple once the ladder was built. So this is sort of like what happened to the tabernacle, you know, kind of episode. And this is actually, you know, controversial. And I mentioned in Unseen Realm that a particular scholar, Richard Elliott Friedman, uh, has articulated this idea in in several publications. And it, it, it creates sort of a neat uh, imagery uh, where the, the big cherubim can be the throne of the Lord and then the Lord's feet, as it were, you know, metaphorically would rest on the ark, you know, if this was the case, if it's moved inside and whatnot. So Friedman is is the scholar who, you know, put this forward really back in 1980. Uh, so this has been around for a while. And he, you know, he published a book later, that this is this is part of it. Um, it, it actually works its way into his Who Wrote the Bible book, which was, uh, you know, a big bestseller back in the day, which popularized uh, the JEDP uh, theory, the approach to the Pentateuch. Um, you know, it, it's popped up in other – Anchor Bible Dictionary, which was published in 1992. His, he has the entry on Tabernacle. So this has been out uh, in a number of sources for a while. And, you know – Many scholars consider it possible, but haven't really glommed onto the idea, largely because this is going to sound weird. Uh, one of the major objections that scholars have to it is that if it's real, if it's true, then the tabernacle would have to be historical. <laughs> Again, in the world of critical scholarship, people, scholars tend to believe that there was no tabernacle, just like there was no Exodus. You know, there, there, there's no tabernacle. This is sort of a mythical story that people who were living during the, the era of the temple sort of take the temple and they retroject it back into Israel's earlier history, and they sort of make up this predecessor. That, and that, since people are so married to that because of either how they date the presumed sources of the Pentateuch or just how they operate with this evolutionary perspective of Israelite religion— since they're married to this kind of thinking, they don't really like Friedman's proposal <laughs> because if he's right, well, then there was a tabernacle and it gets moved in and you know, to the temple and you know, so on and so forth. Now, one particular scholar uh, really hates the idea, and we're going to get to him as well. Uh, but in this episode, I want to summarize what Friedman is arguing for and, and really why, kind of what prompted it. And then we'll get into the, the, the guy who just hates it the most, uh, Avigdor uh, Horowitz, and, and see what criticisms you know, he, he levels at it. So in this episode, we're going to be do, talking about like what happened to the tabernacle. Was it still around when the temple was here? Does it actually get moved in? And, and why would we even think that? Why would we even presume that? Because you would think, well, when they have the temple, they just get rid of the tabernacle. Who cares? You know, they, they, we've been there, done that. Now we're on to this new thing. 
again, there, there are certain things that prompted Friedman to wonder about that. So what I've done in the uh, – if you're a subscriber to the McLaught newsletter, you can get access to the protected folder. I've uploaded one of Friedman's publications, uh, The Tabernacle in the Temple. This is from Biblical Archaeologists way back in 1980. And then when we get to Hurwitz's response, I've also uploaded his uh, article so you can get both sides of this. So Friedman's proposal – Let's just jump in there. His, his biblical archaeologist article begins this way. Okay? He says, in the September 1947 issue of Biblical Archaeologist, there appeared Frank Moore Cross's study, The Priestly Tabernacle, in which Cross challenged the prevailing Wellhausian view. So when you hear Wellhausen, think of the evolution of Israelite religion from polytheism to monotheism. So Cross challenged the prevailing Wellhausian view of the biblical tabernacle in the Wellhausian scheme. The portrayal of the tabernacle, which is the central place of worship for the Israelites in the wilderness, that this is fiction. That's Wellhausen's view. It's the product of the imagination of post-exilic priestly writers. Cross suggested, rather, that the priestly tabernacle account reflects a historical structure, the Tent of David. The purpose of the present study is to pursue further the actual and portrayed history of the tabernacle, looking especially into the years subsequent to David, when Solomon's temple succeeded David's tent. It is argued here that the priestly tabernacle description does indeed reflect a historical pre-Solomon structure, which was placed in the temple and was located there until the, until the destruction by the Babylonians. Let me just stop there. When, when Friedman is defending the historicity of the tabernacle, to him the quote-unquote original tabernacle was a tent that David made. All right, so let's keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to reference the original tabernacle as being something different, that something you know, that was actually real back in the days of, of the Exodus. Okay, so you know, original tabernacle, that phrase might mean something when it, it's, it reflects me or as opposed to cross and then Friedman and what they're arguing for. But the point is that most scholars, you know, just don't believe that there was a tent structure at all. And so they find Friedman's thesis either questionable, uncertain, or they just plain hate on it. So let's go back to Friedman in the rest of his abstract. He says this, if a tabernacle shrine existed, and was popularly and royally venerated until the construction and dedication of the temple, then one might well expect some textual indication of the fate of that shrine after the temple arose. The biblical histories do not report explicitly that the tent of meeting was brought up to the temple of Solomon on the day of the temple dedication, together with the ark and the sanctified vessels. And he references 1 Kings 8.4 here, which I will read. They brought up the ark of the Lord the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent, the priests and the Levites, brought them up. Now, that, again, looks like it does reference the tent of meeting, but you have to realize that there's a whole argument in scholarship about the tent of meeting being different than the tabernacle, and the tent of meeting being the tent, again, that David built, not Moses, because Moses, we don't even know if Moses was real, or there was no exodus. Okay, so that there are going to be certain verses that, to your ear, will sound like they say one thing, but again, scholars are, are you know, critical scholars, you know, the, those who don't feel the, the, the need to, you know, sort of have a high view of Scripture. They don't have a high view of Scripture and therefore don't see the need to affirm lots of things as being genuine. That's where the, the bulk of the world of biblical scholarship is. They're going to be thinking something different when they run into these verses. So, back to, to Friedman's abstract. So, you have the, this verse, 1 Kings 8, 4, about what was brought up to the temple, and he says, this verse has, since Wellhausen, been regarded as a gloss, like just something added later, because of the infrequent references to the tabernacle in the history of the land prior to this report. So, in other words, once Israel gets into the land in the biblical story, he's saying, you know, since, since the tabernacle is really not referred to much, um, when it is— Scholars tend to just say, oh, they're, they're making that up. They're throwing that in, again, to retroject the temple back into earlier biblical history. So that's just how they look at it. So that, that's the end of, of Friedman's abstract. Now, 
just that bit, even though he, you know, Friedman is obviously not in the anything we would call the evangelical world or you know the world of of, of scholars who do assign you know historicity to, to an Exodus and and the tabernacle in the days of Moses. Friedman's not there, but his sentiments run quite contrary to accepted dogma. Again, especially Wellhausen, whose research provided a religious rationale for JEDP in its classical formulation. And again, JEDP is the idea that the Pentateuch was totally not written by Moses. Again, typically they would say Moses, there was no real Moses. If there was, he didn't write anything. But rather that the Pentateuch, the Torah, was written much later, and it is a composite of source documents named J E D N P. So, the documentary hypothesis. So, you know, Friedman is a documentarian. He's just disagreeing with this part of the this sort of the general consensus, and he does assign historicity to the tabernacle, at least the tent in the time of David. So we want to know who Friedman is. He's you know, he's a critical scholar, but he's running against the grain here. Now, from this point, Friedman gets right into his thesis and its trajectory. So I'm going to read what he says. Just lay it out for you. Here, here's his argument. Scholars generally have thought the dimensions of the tabernacle, uh, you know, to that they comprise a reduced scale imitation of the Jerusalem temple. But these dimensions are by no reckoning proportionate to those of either the first or the second temple. In the standard estimates, the tabernacle, as described in the book of Exodus, is 30 cubits in length, 10 in width, and 10 in height. In my own calculation, he says, the tabernacle is 20 cubits in length. So there's a a difference there. 8 in width and 10 in height. And he illustrates this in his article with pictures, how he gets to his dimensions because this is important because for it to fit inside the temple it has to be 20 in length and 8 in width and 10 in height not 30 10 and 10 so he he's he's going to argue how this can be done based on the description of the tabernacle in the book of exodus and he has his own way of laying out the language there so that the dimensions turn out this way he says, the first temple, as described in 1 Kings 6, is 60 cubits in length, 20 in width, and 30 in height. It is thus three times the height of the tabernacle, but twice its length and width. Suggestions of correspondence of the dimensions of the tabernacle with the second temple are groundless, as the dimensions of the second temple are not reported anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. According to Ezra 6.3, Cyrus had directed that the second temple be constructed 60 cubits in breadth, but there's no report concerning whether this direction was followed. And again, the tabernacle dimensions don't correspond. The measurements of the tabernacle correspond rather to those of the space inside the Holy of Holies in the first temple, beneath the wings of the cherubim. According to the description of the temple construction, 1 Kings 6, 2 Chronicles 3, the Holy of Holies, or the Devir, is 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, And within are the two cherubim, each 10 cubits high, their wings are spread, and the wing spread of each is 10 cubits, so that the tips of the wings of each touch the walls of the room on each side and touch each other in the center of the room. I actually have a little picture of of how he describes this in Unseen Realm. Thus the space between the cherubim is 10 cubits in height, 20 cubits in length, and less than 10 cubits in width, as the bodies of the cherubim take up a portion of the center space. The measurements of the tabernacle as pictured in Exodus 26 and 36 are just this 10 cubits in height, 20 cubits in length, and 8 cubits in width. Scholars until now have reckoned the tabernacle dimensions differently owing to the manner in which the tabernacle construction is portrayed in the book of Exodus. The exact measurements are never stated outright. One must rather derive them from the description of the materials and structure. So we'll end there. So what what he's going to say is like, look, we get these we get these instructions, but we're never really told again precisely, you know, how it, you know, what the size is once it's constructed and so on and so forth, or, or you know, and so he's going to take that plus this space within the later temple, and he's going to argue that that he can align them, he can match them, so that the tent structure will fit inside the temple. And now there's a reason why he's doing this. There's a reason why 
he feels that this is important. I mean, you can, as far as the construction, what it would look like and how he, how he puts things together, you can reference the article and look at the pictures. Um, you have to ask, why does he care? <laughs> you know, is he just like fixated with measurements? And, you know, is this guy an engineer or a carpenter, you know, in his other life? No, he, he appeals to certain passages in the Old Testament to justify the idea, to, just basically to justify the whole question and, and the whole endeavor. Um, what, he re- what he's really trying to do is to make certain statements in certain passages make sense. For example, there's a controversy naturally over whether the actual Old Testament tabernacle was still around, around in David's time or whether David made a new tent for the ark. Again, I've mentioned that division uh, before. And again, a lot of scholars don't believe that either of those is historical. But for those that would think the tabernacle is historical, most of them are going to land with this tent that David makes. Because there are references to David making a tent uh, to, um, to house the, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, 1 Chronicles 16, 1 through 6, and verses 37 to 38 seem to suggest that there might be two tents. Now, to understand those verses, though, we have to look at some other ones first, earlier, in, you know, earlier than, than the Chronicles reference. So let's look at 2 Samuel 5, 8 through 11. We're just going to read a few passages and, and just kind of notice some things in them. So 2 Samuel 5, 8 through 11 says this. I'm reading ESV. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. This is the incident when the ark, he reaches out his hand to steady the ark so it doesn't fall off the cart and God strikes Uzzah dead okay, for touching the ark. So David's upset. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Next chapter in Second Samuel, this is Second Samuel 6, 16, and 17. This is the short encounter, or the short account of the ark being brought to Jerusalem. We read this, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. She despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, you know, the question is, you know, how could, how could the ark, I mean, apparently the ark in 2 Samuel 5 didn't have a home. You know, it's outside the, you know, the, the, the tabernacle, and so David's going to take it, you know, to Jerusalem, but then the Uzzah thing happens, and so they leave it at the house of Obed-Edom. He puts it somewhere for three months, and then David goes and gets it out, and he puts it in a tent that he had pitched for it. So there is evidence, again, that, that David, you know, has, has made a tent, you know, for the ark. Now, let's go back to First Chronicles 16, 1 through 6, and read that. This is, again, you know, similar, uh, the, the, the Chronicles version of, of, of what's going on here. They brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, a cake of raisins, so on and so forth. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, second to him was Zechariah, uh, Jael, Shemi, Shemi Ramoth, Jehiel, Matathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of the, of the Lord. So that's the first six verses. You go down to verses 37 and 38, we read this. So David left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the Ark as each day required. And as Obed-Edom and his 68 brothers, while Obed-Edom, the son of Jeduthun and Hosa, were to be gatekeepers. Now, you know, you look at that. Before the Ark, they're ministering before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the Ark as each day required. Friedman is going to, to, to seize on that and say, you know, there were, there were required elements of service 
before the ark that are described in earlier portions of the Hebrew Bible where it seems like the tabernacle structure itself is required. Like the, the, the structure itself has some sort of role to play in some of the rituals. And so he's like, okay, if they're doing this, if we take this seriously, that they're ministering regularly before the ark as each day required, then it seems like the, the original quote-unquote tabernacle is there, or maybe, you know, this is how we should read, you know, the this wording that David builds the tent, and then that sort of becomes the, what, what later scripture you know, or, or, or other scripture calls the tabernacle, or you've got two tents. So there, there's there's something going on here. There's a tent that David builds. Is it the same as the one that uh, the Bible elsewhere calls the tabernacle? Now, again, those who think that the Mosaic tabernacle was real and historical would say, well, you know, maybe David did build a tent. Maybe there was a temporary structure somewhere in Jerusalem for the ark. But if you're going to do this ministry, that implies that the tabernacle has to be used. And maybe this tent that David built, maybe it's just David commanding that the original tabernacle be set up, whereas earlier it wasn't. So you have this controversy, and I don't want to get too lost in in the, the, the tent during the time of David, but it's part of this discussion, because again, you know, all Friedman is arguing is that, look, you know, there, there was something going on here that was real, it was historical. Whether David is setting up the Mosaic tabernacle, and that's what the language means about the tent that David had pitched for it, or whether well, that never really happened, but David himself did actually build a tent in, in which the ark was kept. Either way, okay, what Friedman is arguing is that whatever that was, and whoever built it, is going to get inserted into the temple. And so we need to sort of figure out what's going on here. Now, there are some verses that suggest a tent is associated with the temple, and this is what sets Friedman off on this trajectory, on this, this run. So there's this notion that after the temple was built, there's still tent language associated with, the, with Solomon's temple. And Friedman's like, look, the only way that that can make sense is if this tent structure, again, whether, whether it was David that built it or whether he just reset up the original mosaic tabernacle, you know, he's, he's going to say we don't know that. But whatever it was, that thing gets moved into the temple complex. Because there are certain verses that just associate the, the Temple of Solomon with a tent, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless this other thing is real. So let's take a look at, at, at some, of these, some of these passages that sort of set Friedman off, and this, this will kind of explain why he cares. So let's go to 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 6. Now listen to this carefully. This is the, the Davidic covenant when, when David has the idea to build a temple and then God's going to make a covenant with him and so on and so forth. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God lives or dwells in a tent. Now, this isn't the word mishkan here. So we need to be thinking about vocabulary. Mishkan is the biblical Hebrew word for tabernacle. So, so hold on to that. This isn't that word in particular. It's a different word. But you know, let me just let me just look it up here, and I'll, I'll get it to you. The Ark of God dwells in a tent. Uh, the wording here, again, is not mishkan. It's actually sort of a verb for tent dwelling, or you know, you have you have a verb here, yeshav. Again, to sit or to dwell, and then you have within, and then you have a word for a tent structure that isn't Mishkan. So you've got, a, you've got an, a, an idiomatic phrase here. The Ark of God dwells in a tent. And this bothers David. You know, like, why should I have this nice house? And look, look at where the Ark is. So Nathan said to the king, Do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go. And tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? Now catch this next verse. I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent. Now this word here is ohel. That's the, the Hebrew word for tent. It's not mishkan, which is the term used for the structure of the tabernacle. God says, I've been moving about in a tent 
from my dwelling. Now, how do we take that? You know, it raises a number of questions because in Exodus 26, verse 7, you shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains you shall make. You know, we, we do get the word ohel for the curtain that was draped over the mishkan, over the tabernacle structure. So we have to realize that the tent itself is not the tabernacle. I mean, that might sound a little odd, but it's not. Because we, 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 when we say the word tabernacle, we, we visualize the tent structure. But there are actually different terms here. The, the structure, the frame of what is the tabernacle, that's what's, the, what's called mishkan, and it's draped over with an, a tent, the ohel. So there's actually two parts that make up the whole. And so that's Im- important. It makes it, it makes it coherent that you could have when the word ohel is used, you could actually have a reference to the tabernacle structure because the ohel is the word used for the cloth that draped over the mishkan in, in, in the time of Moses, okay, in the, in the books of Moses, in the book of Exodus. So it's the, it's the tent component of the overall structure. So when God says, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. In other words, I've, I've never had a house. But I have been moving about in a tent. Even though the word is ohel, this can still reference the tabernacle because the ohel is the cloth draped over the structure known as the tabernacle. So this verse could be understood to say, you know what, Nathan, you know, uh, I've come to you in a dream. I heard the other day that David has a desire to build me a house, and I'm still living in the tabernacle here, and it's been fine. That would, again, if you look at the verse that way, that implies that the tabernacle is still standing. It's still used. It's still around. And this is 2 Samuel. Again, this is, this is the, the time of David. And so you could take this passage, that line, what, what God you know, says to Nathan in, in, the, in the dream, and say, well, if that's the case, then maybe the tent that David pitches for the ark is actually the real tabernacle that he has just, you know, maybe it was disassembled or it was somewhere else, and then it has to be taken apart, and then David, you know, erects it again for the ark, you know, so that, that it's nearby. It could be the same thing, and not just some other tent that David makes, like I- implying that the tabernacle is, you know, so to speak, history, like they don't use it anymore, or it got destroyed, or it just wore out, or whatever. And then David said, "Well, we need a tent to cover the thing, so let's do that." It, it could actually be, again, the mosaic structure. So with that, you know, we'll go keep that in mind. Again, this is the time of David now where we, we have a very possible reference to the tabernacle. So another passage that kind of, you know, leads us to wonder or presume that the original tabernacle is still around is 1 Chronicles 7, 5. Go and tell my servant David, and this is the, the Chronicles version of the 2 Samuel 7 passage. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, it is not you who will build me a house to dwell in, for I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up Israel to this day. But I have gone from, and here, this is going to sound odd, I have gone from tent to tent, and from dwelling to dwelling. And the word dwelling there is mishkan, tabernacle, and the the tent to tent is ohel. Now, we actually have a textual difficulty here, because if you look at that in English, it seems like, well, the, the original tent of Moses, that probably wore out, and they had to make another one. You know, I've gone from tent to tent, you know, you know, upgrade, you know, remodel, you know, whatever it is. Um, and from tabernacle to tabernacle. Uh, again, that, that's technically, <laughs> you know, the, the, let, me, let, me, let me just approach it this way. The Septuagint does not have that. So there, there's a textual issue here. The Septuagint actually says, I have gone from being in the tent and in the tabernacle. Okay. In other words, God says, I haven't lived in a house to, since I brought Israel up, but I have gone about, I've been around, gone about in the tent and in the tabernacle. So if you took it, take it that way, you don't have upgrades. You don't have the, the, the original tabernacle wearing out. You don't, you don't have any of that. Uh, so w- which, you know, w- which text is the right one? And again, scholars disagree you know, with this. Like, like, how do we take this? And of course, Friedman's like, look, I'm going to go with the Septuagint, uh, whatever this is. Again, whether it's just a sort of a retrojection in David's day or, or something, some reference to something older, it proves the passage is consistent with Second Samuel seven that that there is a tent structure still around or being used for the ark, 
And that's important to Friedman because now we're going to go to passages that, again, associate the temple itself with some kind of tent, which is really, again, odd to our ear. First Chronicles 9, 17 through 19. Now, this whole passage is a list of people returning from exile. So this is like way, you know, way removed from David. People returning from exile. But the issue in the passage for us is, is how the lost past temple, now the temple's been destroyed, okay? The lost past temple gets referred to. So, so situate yourself mentally. This is after the exile. Temple has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. People are coming back. And then we get this list of people. And it turns out in this list, there, there's actual like temple personnel that families, again, historically, that whose families had, had been servants, you know, in the, in the temple. And we read this. The gatekeepers were Shalom, Akub, Talmon, Achiman, and their kinsmen. Shalom was the chief. Until then, they were in the king's gate on the east side as the gatekeepers of the camps of the Levites. Shalom, the son of Korah, son of Eviasaph son of Korah, and his kinsmen of his father's house, the Korahites, were in charge of the work of the service. Keepers, catch this. These were temple servants, and here's how they're described. This family had been keepers of the thresholds of the tent. Like, like what's that? And then you get go down to verse 21. Zechariah, the son of Meshelamiah, was gatekeeper, quote, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now, this is post-exilic, and this is a list of families who had been temple servants, but they're described as keepers of the thresholds of the tent and working at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Like, what's going on with that? It's the temple, right? Why are we, why are we making it sound like a tent? Another one, Second Chronicles 29, 3 through 7. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. This is a reference to the, the time of Hezekiah, which again is after Solomon. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. Okay, so he opens the doors of the house of the Lord. Sounds very temple-ish, okay? And he says, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord. Let's, let's clean it up. Carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They have forsaken him and have turned, catch this, they have turned away their faces from the Mishkan, the habitation, the ESV says. See, it's interesting that the ESV translator won't use the English word tabernacle here. Because the tabernacle is not supposed to be around anymore. This is the temple. But the same word used of tabernacle over and over and over and over again in the Torah is right there. They have turned their faces from the Mishkan of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. You can see when you read that, it sounds like there is a tent inside the temple. So passages like this are what Friedman's noticing, like, what in the, what is that? Why do we get this language? Friedman also goes to several psalms that appear to reference the temple and tabernacle together. So I'm going to, this one I'm going to read from the, uh, well, let's see, I, I could probably just use the ESV for this. Oh, Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Okay, I love the habitation of your house. This is Psalm 26, 8. The word habitation there is not Mishkan. It's Me'on. Okay, the, the, oh, Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Now, the Jewish Publication Society has, oh, Lord, I love your temple. There's the, the, the house, okay. Your temple abode, the habitation of your house, the ESV says. But here's the second line in, in the JPS, Jewish Publication Society, Tanakh. And the dwelling place, the Mishkan of your glory. That's actually literally what the Hebrew has. So I love your temple, okay? And then the temple is renamed in parallelism as the, the Mishkan of your glory, the tabernacle of your glory. Again, it, it just sounds like 
referring to two things that are, that are overlapping here. You know, you get other references like this in Psalm 43.3, Psalm 46.4, uh, Psalm 132.7. Uh, let, me, let me read that one. Psalm 132.7, let us go to his, you know, the Lord's dwelling place. Let us go to his mishkan, to his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Well, that's a reference to the ark, right? But uh, wait a minute, this is Psalm 132. This is one of the songs of ascent. Songs of ascent are songs that you would sing at returning from exile going up Mount Zion. You're going back home. What in the world is this? I mean, not only don't we have a temple in, in the you know, post-exilic period, but when they're thinking about the place, they use Mishkan and the, the ark, the footstool. Like, what's going on here? So I, I'm hoping you see that these are the kind of passages that Friedman has come across you know, in his study. As an Old Testament scholar, he's like, boy, that, that's just, that sounds a little odd. Could it be? Could it be that they actually, whatever the tent structure was, whether whether it was something David made, and you know, so I don't have to affirm that Moses was real and all this, or again, me speaking, could it be that the, that the original tabernacle was just reconstructed by David or, or something like that? But but either way, that that this thing, whatever it is, is moved inside the temple, and that's why you get this language. I mean, some of these these verses are are really kind of suggestive of that. So in Unseen Realm, you know, I, I, I actually kind of like this idea. I think it does make sense of this, but, but ultimately it's going to come down to, to one or two things. So let, let's just transition here. You might ask, well, how in the world can anybody deny this? I mean, the, the verses look kind of clear. I mean, Mishkan used in these late verses, and this is clearly the, the, the word in Exodus 26 and 27 for the structure of the tabernacle. And, and Ohel is also used in some of these passages, and that would be the tent that's draped over the structure. It, it seems like the language is pretty clear. How, you know, how can you object to this? Well, let me start with a few general ones, and then I'll get to Hurwitz, who really hates the idea. General objection number one, you know, people will argue that psalm references to the Mishkan aren't the tabernacle. They'll say the word is just being used to talk about God's dwelling place in general, they're, they're, it's generic. Okay, you know, okay, it's Mishkan, it's the same word, but but that can't be re really the tabernacle here. This this it just refers to a dwelling place, wherever that is and whatever that is. Two, they'd oppose Friedman on uh, the the textual issue on, in First Chronicles seventeen five tent to tent tabernacle to tabernacle, and they would say, look, you know. This alone says that the original tabernacle wasn't around. They're just, you know, building whatever they can, you know, making tents or whatever. So this, this place, uh, this, this ark has some place to sit. You know, it, it's not the real thing. Well, okay, you know, that, I, I guess it's, it's, it's at least fair, you know, to, to go with one version of the text in First Chronicles 17.5 and to just say that the Mishkan references are, they're, they're sort of metaphorical or they're generic, okay? That's all well and good. You know, you could... You could sort of do that. But the reality is, is that doesn't address the idea that the Israelite priesthood used a tent structure for the ark and effectively, you know, maybe a rebuilt tabernacle or something. They moved some kind of tent into the temple. That's really what Friedman's after. So you can say that, that again, some of this is generic or, again, metaphorical or whatever, but you still have other verses like the one where they open the doors and then the references there to you know to it to the tent and whatnot. It just you know why why even use the language? Why even use that kind of language? It, it would seem like the writer should have known that 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 would just create confusion with the old you know tabernacle. Why even use it? So we we seem to be you know kind of at a standstill, or at least that's the way generally it, you know Friedman's argument is is opposed. And this is why a lot of scholars say, well, that's okay. We'll think about it. We'll think about it. We're not really persuaded, but yeah, you know, let, let's think about it. What's the harm? Well, to Hurwitz, again, he just hates the idea. He just, I mean, this, this has sort of been like a, a thing that gives him a, uh, the way he writes, it's like, now I have some reason to get up in the morning so I can go attack Friedman's view. Uh, the main voice, again, who has no time at all for it, is Victor Avigdor Hurwitz. And he wrote a book, or not a book, but a, an article called The Form and Fate of the Tabernacle, Reflections on a Recent Proposal. 
It's from the Jewish Quarterly Review, 1995. So this is 15 years after, you know, Friedman. His original article, it's a few years after the Anchor Bible Dictionary article, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to read you part of this, and you're going to see why I characterize Hurwitz the way I do. Uh, he writes this. Richard Elliott Friedman has argued that the Mosaic Tabernacle, described by the Pentateuchal priestly source, stood in the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem Temple. In order for the tabernacle, usually figured to be 10 cubits wide and 30 cubits long, to fit into a space 20 cubits square, Friedman has proposed a radical rearrangement of the tabernacle's components, thereby shrinking its measurements in comparison to standard reconstructions. Friedman's suggestions have met with a modicum of acceptance in scholarly literature, although the details of his argument have never been evaluated. The present article rejects absolutely every aspect of Friedman's proposal. A review of Exodus 25 through 40 reconfirms standard tabernacle reconstructions with some minor alterations. Detailed scrutiny of Friedman's argumentation shows that his innovative plan is based on numerous incorrect and impossible interpretations of crucial passages in the biblical text. The tabernacle proposed by Friedman is, consequently, completely without textual support. There is also no biblical evidence whatsoever that a tabernacle of any size or shape ever stood in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Post-biblical literature occasionally speculates about the whereabouts of the Mosaic tabernacle, and these speculations represent a topic worthy of future scholarly discussion. But these late musings, these recent musings, are products of exegetical questions raised by the extant form of the Bible and contribute nothing to the historical question of how the tabernacle was disposed of when the temple was built. Now, if you think that's snarky, he's, he later says this, Friedman's reconstruction of the tabernacle is wrong in every detail, has not a shred of evidence in its support, does serious harm to an understanding of the structure and the text describing it, and reflects a total disregard for the most fundamental pillars of sound exegesis, and in particular, concern for the Hebrew language. <laughs> I mean, th that is brutal, okay? And it's really unusually brutal. It's the kind of language that I have only seen in peer-reviewed literature in reviews of, like, pseudo-archaeology books. You know, like the stuff I would do on, on Paleo Babel or Fringe Bop, you know, where, where a scholar actually takes the time to read, you know, some some book like like Ahmed Osman, you know, Moses was, I don't know what, what I can't remember what his view is, but you know, the, it's part of the Afrocentric, you know, kind of, kind of thinking about the Exodus and whatnot. And, and when, when scholars actually get a hold of that stuff and some of Graham Hancock's, you know, books have been reviewed, they, they are just brutal, but I've never seen anybody be that brutal to someone who, I mean, Friedman has a degree from Harvard, and he's well-known and well-published. You know, this is really unusually brutal. So Hurwitz is really this, – this is pushing his buttons. He just hates it. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to at least summarize you know, the, the criticism so you kind of know what he's so exercised about. First, he, he doesn't like the way Friedman understands the construction description of the tabernacle. Like he doesn't like the way Friedman interprets the, the, the in construction language. And, you know, it does run contr contrary to the consensus, but again, Hurwitz just sort of flips out over it. And second, he feels there's no textual evidence to, evidence to support the idea of a tent inside the temple structure. He's going to take all of these passages, and I only read you a, a handful that, that, you know, sort of generate the question for Friedman. He's going to take all of them as metaphorical, just out of the gate. Now, another paragraph from Hurwitz, though, gives us a better feel, I think, for what's going on inside Hurwitz's head here. He writes, Friedman's revisions are not mere, merely a barren academic exercise. <laughs> there he goes again. All right. Friedman's revisions are not merely a barren academic exercise in what he jokingly calls cubit counting. Rather, they have weighty consequences in the realm of cultic history and source criticism. The reduction in size of the tabernacle enabled Friedman to make an even more surprising suggestion, namely that the tabernacle stood in the Holy of Holies of the First Temple. Under the extended wings of the cherubim, a space only 20 cubits deep and less than 10 cubits wide. This suggestion permitted him to propose an even further reaching hypothesis. In his opinion, certain biblical references to the temple, as if it were a tent or tabernacle, are not to be taken as metaphorical language. Dun, 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 dun. Like how dare Friedman suggest that the Mishkan, again, even if it's something David built, was actually real. 
But instead, Hurwitz says, they actually refer to the real historical tabernacle. This is what Friedman's saying. You know, can you believe it? I mean, like the, the, this hysterical crescendo. He's actually saying that these references refer to the real historical tabernacle, which stood in the Holy of Holies from the days of Solomon until Jerusalem's destruction by the Babylonians. Only in this way, according to Friedman, would it be possible to carry out the priestly demand that sacrifice be performed at the entry of the tabernacle. There's that, that reference there to... Uh, serving before the uh, before the tent as each day required. So since the, Herowitz again, since the priestly source refers to and predicates its cultic regulations on a structure which existed in the time of the first temple but no longer exists in the post-exilic age, P, this is what, he, what he's really mad at, P must accordingly be pre-exilic. Well, so, you have to realize, J, E, D, P. P is last. That is the classic formulation of the documentary hypothesis. P must be exilic or post-exilic. How dare Friedman move the date of P to before the exile? How dare he do that? And we're, we're forced to do that if, if he's right here. So this is what flips him out. And that, this might seem really, really arcane. and you know, It kind of is. But this seems to suggest, again, what, what again, really is pushing his buttons. It may sound trivial, but you have to realize that certain beliefs about the evolutionary progression of Israelite religion are tied to the presumed lateness of P. There's a reason why it's J, E, D, and P. Okay, There's stuff in P, the, the, the alleged P source, that surely must be later. Well, why must it be later, Mr. Scholar? Well, it has to be later because of what's going on theologically in P, because that's the kind of stuff that only like an, an enlightened, you know, religious person would say or think. We can't have this early in Israel's history because Israel's, Israel's religion evolved from primitive polytheism, you know, to the, this crescendo moment of monotheism. And, and so P starts to sound, you know, like, like it fits there. And, and it has these lofty religious ideas that surely the, the primitives wouldn't have come up with. And so P must be late. It must be last in the sources. And now, again, Friedman is a documentarian, but he's not married to the Wellhausen trajectory of the, uh, the evolution of Israelite religion. And so he has committed the cardinal sin among source critics by moving P before the exile. That messes the whole picture up. This is why, incidentally, I did a paper at Regional SBL once on anthropomorphic language in P. I've actually, you know, put this out on Amazon as a, as a Kindle file. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> they just don't want to hear that. Uh, there is anthropomorphic language in P, you know. And, and so, well, anthropomorphism, making deities, you know, like putting them as, as human figures, that's what primitives do, you know. It's just like uh, that, that's how primitive people think about their gods, you know, like as animals and as, you know, partly humans or humans. And later on, you know, we, we become more enlightened and we become, you know, this is me talking now, but we become like deists. You know, like 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 we have these loftier concepts of God and his transcendence and his distance and his wonder and his blah 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 blah. You know, like like you 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 put God on 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 the earth, you know, standing next, you know, to to Abraham or somebody. Well, that's the kind of thing that you know animists and polytheists, you know, would do because they they interact with their gods. But the more enlightened of us, no, the gods are you know, God is distant and superior and transcendent. And again, the, like these ideas aren't compatible. Like, like, like this has to be a, a, an evolutionary, you know, arc in, in, in religious thinking. You know, honestly, this is this is really imposing modern Enlightenment conceptions on the Hebrew Bible. You know, that's what Wellhausenism is. It really is uh, defining like Elohim plurality of Elohim. That must be polytheism. References to a divine council must be polytheism. Yeah, you only think that way because you're modern. Okay, even the term polytheism and monotheism are, are modern terms. And so you're, you're retrojecting your own thought processes, your own worldview, your own way of thinking about things onto the Hebrew Bible. And then you're, you're tearing it apart in its sources and then putting, putting it together according to an evolution of religion. 
that's what the JEDP theory in its classical form actually does. You know, and you all know me in this audience. I'm not a traditional mosaic authorship guy. I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. I mean, Friedman is committed to a documentary view you know, of, of source criticism. But, but again, he's not buying the Wellhausen thing at this point, at least. And Hurowitz wants to beat him over the head with it. He's daring to tamper you know, with, with this wonderful trajectory, this evolutionary trajectory. So this is really what's driving the bus for him. Uh, again, it, oh, let's see, I, I want to find one more, one other quote here. Um, so you know, again, you, you can see what's driving the bus here. Hurwitz actually says this in, in, in one, one paragraph. It seems clear that Friedman's desire to prove the relative antiquity of P led him to defend the historicity and continued existence of the tabernacle. So again, he, he's like, this is what, what Friedman's really doing. He, he wants so desperately you know, to, to, to mess with the Wellhaus and Reconstruction that he, he's looking for any way he can to take P and move it before the exile. Well, you know, Friedman could just turn around. That he could turn that sentence around and say this against Hurwitz. It seems clear that Professor Hurwitz's desire to prove the relative recency of P led him to deny the historicity and continued existence of the tabernacle. This is just tit for tat. This is what Hurwitz has here. He's got tit for tat. But again, it shows, again, what's really pushing his buttons. And for our purposes here, the real issue, again, is are these references to the Mishkan linked in these temple passages, especially if they're exilic or post-exilic? That's pretty clear, like Psalms of Ascent. Are they real or, or, or is this metaphorical language? That's really the issue. And, and you know, rather than, than sort of, you know, again, I think point out the obvious that, that Hurwitz has an axe to grind here. That's actually the more honest question that he raises and, and others raise. You know, do we have metaphorical language here? And sort, you know, toward, you know, proving Friedman wrong in this regard, when he finally gets to, instead of beating up Friedman and calling him a hack, okay, and, and calling him, God forbid, uh, a, a defender of, of the antiquity of P, you know, the, the cardinal sin here among source critics. When he gets past that and he, he starts talking about, is this metaphorical or not? Hurwitz, you know, objects again to, you know, the way Friedman handles the text. He doesn't like, again, some of the text critical decisions he makes. He doesn't like some of the way he, some of the, the way he translates certain words. Again, Friedman's translations are all within the semantic domain of a given word, but they're not the, they're not the translations that Hurwitz prefers because naturally Friedman's arguing his case. He translates a passage in a certain way to, to have it work with his thesis, basically showing that it can work. And Hurwitz just doesn't want to, want to, want to put up with that. So we get a little of this again, tit for tat, or you say potato, I say potato, you know, sort of, you know, language. But, but when he actually gets to the Mishkan references, Here's what Hurwitz writes, and this is kind of remarkable. He says, much of Friedman's evidence for the tabernacle in the temple thesis comes from the book of Chronicles. And again, he mentions the Psalms later too. It is curious that not a shred of evidence comes from the older book of Kings. So he's assuming Kings is older than Chronicles. Okay, well, that's fair. It's, not a, it's not, a, not a shred of evidence comes from the older book of Kings, since the chronicler clearly identifies the temple with the tabernacle in ways too numerous to detail here. There is no reason to assume that when he refers to the temple as Mishkan, he's doing anything else. In general, any independent statement of the chronicler must be assumed suspect, unless otherwise proven. So, so did, did you catch that? Since the chronicler clearly identifies the temple with the tabernacle, he actually admits this. The chronicler does do this. Like, like Friedman's examples, that yeah, that does happen. But we have to view what the chronicler does with suspicion. <laughs> now, what, what's remarkable, again, from that point and, and from that point forward in Hurwitz's article, is that he discusses none of the verses that I actually quoted in the episode that Friedman references in his article. Hurwitz doesn't address any of them. He doesn't, he doesn't specifically go into any of them. He only references one particular verse that I, you know, I didn't include here, or that you know, Friedman doesn't really do much with, Psalm 27.5. You know, you know, Friedman you know, cited it, but he doesn't you know, do, do anything with it. But, but this is the one that Hurwitz picks out. 
he will conceal me, you know, for he will conceal me in his pavilion. The word there is Sukkah, like the, the, the Sukkot, the, the Feast of Booths, okay? So it's a little structure. He will, he will conceal me in his Sukkah in, the, in a day of trouble. He will hide me in the covert of his tent. The lemma there is Ohel. So Hurwitz, again, there's, there's not a whole lot in there. I mean, like I said, Friedman at least includes this as a reference in his article, but doesn't really develop it. But Hurwitz says this verse proves at most, just the opposite of what Friedman wants to demonstrate. It is obvious that the entire temple and probably the courtyards are referred to here. Well, I just read the verse. That really isn't obvious. Does Friedman imagine that a person would take refuge in the Holy of Holies, which is where he claims the tabernacle stood? Now, that's actually a good question. Does Friedman imagine that a person would take refuge in the Holy of Holies, which is where he claims the tabernacle stood. The remaining verses adduced by Friedman are likewise misinterpreted and no more convincing. So he, what Hurwitz says is he pulls this one out, and he actually asks a good question. Does the psalmist really think that he can, can go into sacred space like this for protection? Again, that sounds pretty compelling, but there's actually a problem with it. True. I mean, no ordinary person, like unless you were a Levite, sanctified to, to do this, no ordinary person would think of hiding in the holy place, holy of holies, if they weren't allowed to. But here's the question. Would they even think the thought of a tent structure if there was no tent structure there in the first place? In other words, how does it even occur to the psalmist to use that language if there's no tent to be seen anyway? I mean, you could argue that the psalmist is just saying this to sort of, it's like heightened rhetoric. You know, he wants to be near God or something like that because God's his protector. You could take the, the whole verse, you know, Psalm 27, 5, metaphorically, the way Horowitz wants you to take everything else. But the real question is, why would you get the wording if there was no tent there anyway? Hmm. So it seems like you could actually use Psalm 27, 5 to argue Friedman's point. They wouldn't think of that unless that's what they're looking at. That's what they know is in there or they see. So where does this leave us? Well, for my part, as we wrap up here, I need you know, a better refutation of the passages that basically generate the whole discussion. You know, the references that, that seem to refer to the temple as a tent or, or being accompanied by a tent or something like that, they, I mean, they, they seem like that's what they say. You know, if we have a real tent referred to in these passages, if, if they can be taken at face value, then Friedman's alternate readings and the way he translates things and the way he constructs the tabernacle, that might be a good way to explain those, those verses. You know, Friedman might be on the right path, you know, because Friedman does take them seriously. It's like, well, to account for that, we've we got to take another look at Exodus 26 and 27 and, and see how the thing was constructed. You know, can it be constructed in such a way that it, it would fit in there to make sense of this? I mean, if these, again, later references that, that sort of mesh temple intent, if they can be taken at face value, then what Friedman's trying to do is worth trying to do. But again, that's just where I'm at. So before I abandon Friedman's proposal. This is why I included it in Unseen Realm. Before I abandon it, I'd like to have more certainty that there really is no tent in view at all. And I don't think Hurwitz supplies that. Yes, you know, he, he brings up some things that, sure, you could read it, you know, in a way different than Friedman does, and then that undermines Friedman's thesis. Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, you can do that. But the question is, must you? The question is, can Friedman's thesis work? And, and again, the, the real question, the bigger question is, do we need it or something like it to account for these references in later material when we have a temple for sure, or, or we did, and you still get this tent language? Should we take those at face value? If, we, if, we, if we're going to do that, then we need something like what Friedman is talking about. Either what he's saying, take it as workable, or something that works better. And I just don't think Hurwitz, for me anyway, has met that, that bar. All right, Mike. Well, we appreciate it. That wraps up 26 and 27. And uh, yep. 
Next sure week, does. <laughs> <laughs> next week, Mike, we're going to have a good interview uh, with Dirk Smith of the Eastern European Mission. So be looking forward to that. That'll be good. Yep. And also, Mike, uh, next show, it's going to be, uh, it's a new year. It's 2020. So uh, this is the last show of 2019. And uh, I want to wish yep. everybody, everybody a happy new year. Yeah. I hope everybody had a good Christmas and uh, I hope everybody has a good 2020. Was 2019 good for you, Mike? Got a new job. Yeah, it was. I mean, I mean it yeah. was, it was, yeah, it was, it was really productive. You know, we, I think we saw, you know, growth in the podcast. We saw certainly uh, the growth of the influence of, of Unseen Realm and Supernatural. So I expect in 2020 that to continue and then the, the knives to come out. <laughs> I'm still a little bit cynical here, you know, like, like that there's going to be enough people who are irritated by the, uh, the, the notion that we need to recover the supernatural worldview of the Bible. Somebody's going to come out of the woodwork and, and start hammering at me. So I have that to look forward to, Trey. You know, yeah. just, it'll be wonderful. <laughs> we can kiss 20, 2019 goodbye and, and look forward to, you know, more years as well. So five's a good number, nice and round, at least uh, counting in fives anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 been a good time, and so I I've enjoyed it. I know people have enjoyed it, been impacted by it. So, you know, let, let's just keep at it. All right, with that, I want to thank you everybody for listening to the Next Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.